we can see your slide but you can make it on the yes yes it's uh, full screen okay can you see my slide okay yes 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 okay good and uh yes, let me move the crossover over here okay Okay, so thank you very much for having me at your uh, Indian chapter, and I'm delighted to be here today. I am a practicing attending physician covering hospital service, emergency department, and critical care department monthly basis. But basically, I started my career as an internist, and I'm proud of that. And today I would like to convey, share, I would like to share a very basic and thorough approach for headache, low back pain, and sore throat. Okay. Just a second. It looks like I cannot move my slide. Okay, it worked. So I'd like to start with the red flags for headache. Headache. <laughs> I still get nervous when dealing with a headache and get my he headache myself when dealing with patient whose chief complaint is headache because the differential diagnosis is broad and include critical diagnosis. In my talk today, I'd like to convey to early career physicians the importance of a thorough approach to bread and butter cases and the importance of always use the same formats and make the most of red flags for safer and thorough practice for patients. For attending physicians, my talk could be too basic, but just uh, I would like to em em emphasize the importance of verbalizing your thinking process for bedside teaching. Our sample case is a 60-year-old man who came to your urgent care facility for headache. This urgent care facility deals with only walking patients and does not have x-rays, CT scans, or extensive labs. All you can do is history and physical, EKG, CBC, and CRP. That means our history and physical exam skills are, we have to decide the right management for the patients. So history of present illness. He was drinking alcohol beverage at home this evening and started vomiting and having headache. Past medical history was significant for CKD, hypertension, dyslipidemia, on, on, on statin. The information from the screening nurse, or what we call the triage nurse, was, okay, we have a man who drank alcohol and having headache and vomiting and came to our very busy urgent care center at 10 p.m. It's probably just alcohol intoxication. So the differential diagnosis for headache is broad. I listed thorough differential lists here that includes chronic headache syndrome. Let me use the pointer here. That includes chronic uh, headache syndrome and cerebral vascular event, especially subarachnoidal hemorrhage, hypertensive emergency, brain tumor, and meningitis. And less common, but what we shouldn't miss are Temporal arthritis, carbon monoxide poisoning, or glaucoma attack. And when we think of differential diagnosis, it is important that we categorize them as three C's, common, critical, and curable. The most common ones would be, of course, the primary headache category, but critical and curable, or at least interventionable, are those subarachnoidal hemorrhage and meningitis. When we deal with any emergency or urgent care patient, history is at most important even in our current era of COVID-19 pandemic and advanced imaging technology. We use this format at our facility as a consensus. They are site intensity, quality, onset, radiation, associated symptoms, aggravating and alleviating factors, previous similar symptoms, and treatment at that time. And among those, when we take history of headache, the onset is uh, the utmost important. How do you ask about the onset? When you ask, did it start acutely or gradually? The patient may answer it started acutely, but it does not tell us the most important information. We need to ask whether it started acutely or suddenly, acute onset headache or sudden onset headache because the differential is totally different. And the best way is to ask, 
Do you remember what you were doing when the pain started, when the pain came on? And in this sample case, this is an actual case I saw at Urgent Care Nightfall recently. His answer was, I just had uh, one can of beer, which is normal for me, and climbed upstairs to go to sleep. I went to the bathroom, and when I was going to flush the toilet, I felt like I was beaten in my head from behind. And this is diagnostic of sudden onset headache, or in other words, thunderclap headache. And etiology, uh, the, the reason that we should ask whether it's acute or sudden, the etiology of sudden onset symptoms is categorized as these four categories. They are either rupture like subarachnoidal hemorrhage in our case, or rupture of ectopic pregnancy. Uh, uh, this is not only headache uh, in general. Or obstruction like SMA thrombosis, tear like aortic dissection or carotid artery or vertebral artery dissection, or strangulation of small bowel or sigmoid volubilis or ovarian cystogen. The following clinical course of this sample case was neuro exam was non-focal and the patient's mental status was still maintained okay with the GCSE 3 v 5 M6. But based on this sudden onset headache, I arranged emergency transfer to tertiary care facility where CT scan was available, conveying the information to the accepting physician that subarachnoidal hemorrhage is highly suspected and will roll to the CT room as soon as we arrive. I recall it was within 10 minutes after the patient arrived to our urgent care that we left for the tertiary hospital. And the CT at the tertiary care hospital showed subarachnoidal hemorrhage with the Pentagon sign. The patient was immediately started on nicarotipine drip and proceeded with neural surgical surgery intervention. Early diagnosis is essential for subarachnoidal hemorrhage because rebleeding is associated with a higher rate of complication and worse neurological outcomes. The mortality associated with rebleeding is as high as 70%, and early diagnosis is inter in and interventions are closely related to better neurological outcomes. This is one of the good examples that we internists can change the life of the patient. And uh, this is a social media post that I was profoundly impressed recently. We do not get tired when we work too much, but we get burned out when we lose sight of why we are doing it. And uh, during this COVID-19 fifth attack in Japan, to be honest, in a tertiary care hospital I am located, majority of patients exacerbated and passed away despite prolonged course of in intensive care. Now, the reason is uh, we accepted only the sickest patients, so mild cases recovered and discharged, but I felt like all the patients who was admitted and who can, who we cannot send out of our hospitals just they just they just died on us, and I must say that it really took a toll on our health. So what I wanted to say was that the overnight shift of this urgent care is quite physically demanding with sleep deprivation, but it rather has significantly positive effect on my mental health. We can still save the patients save our patients. And uh, we can share these skill sets with early career physicians and it is our response, our uh, as attending physicians responsibility to uh, pass these skill sets to the early career physicians. And in order to do that, we can convey our thorough thinking process. And these are the red flags for headache and the corresponding diagnosis for them. In subarachnoidal hemorrhage or intracranial hemorrhage, they may have neurological deficit, visual disturbance, and like our sample case, thunderclap headache. And in any increased intracranial pressure status, like brain metastasis, brain tumor, sinus thrombosis, patients may have worsening headache in the morning or with the spine, nausea vomiting, and cranial nerve 7 or abducens nerve palsy. And these are indicative of increased intracranial pressure. Meningeal irritation sign or fever may be seen in, men in meningitis and are red flags. Altered mental status is also one of the, also always the red flags. 
And by going through these red flag signs, early career physicians can have the same thorough approach to our patient. Next, I'd like to briefly go over uh, red flags for lower back pain. I didn't make it case-based, but with the same thinking process, we can use these red flags for lower back pain. Lower back pain is also a very common presentation and most of them will resolve on their own just with physical therapy and short course of NSAIDs, as you know. And taking MRI for all these cases is not practical and it is not high value care. But there could be less common but critical lower back pain we cannot afford to miss. And there are main three categories for critical lower back pain. In bone metastasis of cancer or vertebral osteomyelitis, patient may have history of cancer, unintentional weight loss, immunosuppressive status, or recent history of bacteremia, IV drug use, or, or no improvement with uh, conservative management. And in spinal fracture or osteoporotic compression fracture, patients may have history of trauma. Uh, they could be osteoporotic or elderly. In coda equina syndrome, patients may have urinary retention, overflow incontinence, loss of anal sphincter tone, fecal incontinence, subtle anesthesia, or weakness in lower extremities. I recall we used to have template for lower back pain in medical record at my previous facility of Virginia Mason Medical Center. And it really helped us to be thorough and speed up our clinical practice. Finally, I'd like to review red flags for sore throat or five killer sore throat. Five differential of killer sore throat that we use at our facility as a consensus is uh, our acute epiglottitis, peritonsillar abscess, retropharyngeal abscess, Lemire syndrome, and Ludovic's angina. In acute epiglottitis, they may have dyspnea, dysphagia, or typical hot potato voice and excessive drooling. So this is what I do to teaching to younger physicians. Is the gestalt of acute epiglottitis is like patient talks like they are having a very hot potato in his or her mouth. Patient is usually leaning forward because of the narrowing of the airway and they cannot talk properly. And it sounds like having hot potato in, in their mouth. Like, doctor, I have a very sore throat and I feel short of breath. I, I can swallow. And the patient is usually holding towels or tissue under his or her mouth because they cannot uh, control, handle, handle saliva. In peritonsillar abscess, they may have trisms, difficulty opening their mouth, or unilateral peri peritonsillar swelling. And retropharyngeal abscess, it may lack specific signs or symptoms, so it is important to have high index of suspicion, but they may have strider. In Lemire syndrome or septic thrombophilipitis of internal jugular vein. They may have signs or symptoms of sepsis and pain over, in, over internal jugular vein. In Ludwig's angina, this is oral floor tissue cellulitis. The patient may have swelling uh, around their chin or tongue, so they may have double chin or double tongue and swelling of oral floor tissue or subcutaneous emphysema around there. Okay. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, educational activities of general internists and hospitalists in Japan. This is a picture in this picture is autumn leaves in Japan. They are lovely. We have an organization called Japan Hospitalist Network, which is an educational NPO. This is an independent organization from ACP Japan chapter, but the members quite overlap. We publish high quality review journal and post clinical updates on website. And I write teaching blog in it as shown in this presentation. As a project of ACP Japan chapter in the clinic, translation project is up and running and uh, this in the clinic content is also the basis of the bedside teaching as shown in my presentation today. 
This is a physical examination video series delivered from a medical educational plat streaming platform. And I am the director in chief of this video series. And this series is the best view video throughout this year. This indicates that there is, although in this uh, advanced imaging era, there is still high demand from physicians that they want to achieve good history, physical taking skills and clinical reasoning skills. And that is us internist best expertise field. Last but not least, ACB Japan chapter holds an annual meeting in Kyoto and Dr. Maheshwari once came to give us a great lecture. And last year was virtually, and that includes journal updates 30 and mix up review. And rather than each physicians doing the review and summarize the high yield content, if we do it together, we can achieve more. And ACP Japan chapter plays a central role in this, and I'm delighted that now we can spread that network with your impressively active Indian chapter. And uh, we are proudly being general, thorough, sticking to the basics. And this is a beautiful night view in Yokohama. I hope you could come to Japan, Kyoto, Yokohama, once this COVID-19 pandemic settles down sometimes, hopefully in the near future. Thank you.